Hey kids, Mr. Fly here, hope you're well. Now I'm a lucky lad because the last few days I've been riding this, the Royal Enfield Interceptor 650. It's a great value, great fun bike to ride. And if you're interested in this machine, you're going to want to stick around and stay tuned. So I first rode a 650 Interceptor about uh, six months or so ago. It was, in fact, it was this very bike. Uh, I borrowed this one from the Bike Den, the uh, Royal Enfield uh, dealers in Watford by the way so thanks very much to those guys and I've had it for the weekend just to get to know the bike a bit better because I just gave it a one hour test ride before uh, time enough to form an initial opinion but I was really impressed with the bike and I wanted to get to know it a bit more so as I say I've been lucky enough to be riding this for the last couple of days to get to uh, know it so I've ridden it in all sorts of weathers on all sorts of roads in all sorts of conditions this video is going to be my more in-depth review of the bike I'm going to look at uh, what it's like on country roads what it's like on the motorway what it's like to refuel what it's like to ride in rain all that kind of stuff and I've got some uh, details about cost of ownership as well which I'll take you through and then towards the end of the video I'm going to give you the rundown of all the lessons I've learned since I've been riding this bike not just the good things but the negatives too so stick around and stay tuned So what's it like riding the uh, Interceptor in inclement conditions then? Well I don't get much more inclement than this absolutely horrible out here today now, I don't like riding any motorcycle in the rain to be fair and I can't say as I'm enjoying this very much but the Interceptor does have ABS, which is uh, very good in terms of giving you a bit of confidence for braking. You've got very little in the way of uh, protection from the weather, because it is of course a naked bike, so if you're on a motorway or whatever it rains, you're going to get the full force of the rain and so on at you, but that's just the way it is with naked machines. And it's a very simple motorcycle, there's no riding mode or anything like that, so there's no rain mode you can put it in to, sort of the you know, to soften the throttle response or anything like that, but uh, it's a relatively low powered bike, so you don't need that anyway, so no problem there. Tyres wise, it's fitted with the retro looking Pirelli Phantoms, that actually work very well in the wet, I feel, you know, pretty confident here, it doesn't feel like the bike's sliding around or anything like that. So all in all, if you can avoid riding in the wet, do so, but if you get caught out like I have today, then no problem riding the uh, Interceptor in the wet. So how about faster roads, dual carriageways, motorways, that sort of thing on the Interceptor? Well I have to say I've been very pleasantly surprised with this bike. Even though it's tuned for low down grunt, on the motorway it's absolutely fine. Here I am holding a steady 70 miles an hour indicated. Keep it up with traffic, no problem at all. There is loads more to give as well. There's no lack of power on this bike. So keeping up with traffic is definitely not a problem on this Royal Enfield. In terms of wind protection, this particular machine's got the little bikini fairing, or the little windscreen, whatever you want to call it on here. It does a reasonable job of throwing the wind over you, actually. I'm not in uh, any dirt yet. I mean, it is a vacant, basically a naked a bike, so I am getting battered on my legs and on my torso a bit from wind, but it's no worse than any other naked that I've been on. Certainly it's not that terrible turbulent stuff, you can stand it, it's no problem at all. So, yeah, faster roads, if you've got to do some miles on motorways on your commute, or if you want to do a bit of touring and you can do some motorways, not a problem at all on the Interceptor. OK, it's all very well uh, riding the uh, Interceptor 650 around, enjoying its lazy characteristics, but uh, what's it like practically if you want to actually move the bike around on your driveway? Well. I'll come to my usual car park. Let's uh, park it in a standard car parking spot here. And let's just see what she's like to move around. So far neutral. Which is actually very easy on this bike. Side stand is nice and simple to get down as well. Doesn't feel weighty at all when you tilt the bike over. And then usefully what Royal Enfield have done look, is provide you with this handle here so you can grab hold of it. Excuse my little cheat sheet there. <laughs> so uh, to lift off the side stand nice and light, I'll go around full lock and we'll, uh, we'll see how quickly she gets around this parking spot. There we go, that's uh, 180 degrees basically in one parking spot. So I was in the middle of that one, full lock round, 180 degrees, no problem at all. So tight turning circle and really quite nice and easy to move around. Because it's a low uh, bike in terms of its height, uh, it's actually pretty easy to move around thanks as well to those grab handles. So uh, yeah, no problem lugging the bike around on the side stand. Right, let's get some uh, hopper juice on board the uh, Interceptor. See what she's like at the fuel station. See if there's any surprises. Not expecting any. 
but you know when you ride different bikes they're not always as uh, straightforward as maybe they should be if I could just find out to get into the fuel station that would be a plus let's do a bit of pay up pump there we go now what I love about these is this uh, fuel cap sort of monster ish style it lifts up there right let's see what she's like to get off not hard at all except you twist it the opposite way to what you might expect okay let's get this done right then a bit of Asda's finest unleaded in we go and there we have it unfortunately I'm not gonna have the bike long enough to uh, use the whole tank up to do a proper calculation of what the fuel economy is like but I'm expecting it to be pretty um, pretty frugal so no surprises there in fueling up except perhaps the fact that the cap you just twist that the opposite way to what you might think anyway there we go all fueled up Alrighty, let's get this show back on the road then. Let's do my usual thing, see how long it takes for the fuel gauge to register that we've uh, filled her up. Let's have a look. Uh, and in fact, it's instantly gone to full, so uh, absolutely fine. Let's set the trip down as well. There we go. Alright, so the fuel gauge behaves itself, registers that it's full immediately. And uh, no tricky surprises actually filling it up, I'm glad to say. Uh, I'll get out of here. Right, to practical matters. Uh, people often ask me uh, some sort of questions to do with uh, practical matters on bikes when I do these reviews, and uh, a few things often come up. So number one that often comes up is uh, how loud is the horn on the bike? So it's quite difficult to show you picking up from the uh, lapel mic, but here we go. We'll turn it on and give the horn a go. <coughs> It's got actually got quite a nice two-tone sound, and that is pretty loud. <coughs> yeah, that's good. All right, so the horn is pretty good, so that's one thing. Uh, next thing, how about uh, maintaining the bike? What about things like pumping the tyres? Well, unfortunately, this bike has those um, straight-through valves, so if you're going to pump the tyres up, you might have a bit of a fight to get in amongst the spokes, or you can get yourself some of those um, little right-angle valve uh, tops if you want. But uh, So there's that to be aware of. Not a major point, but sometimes uh, people ask about it. Um, another thing is the chain on this. It is a chain-driven bike, so you're going to have to lubricate the chain. The good news is it comes with a centre stand, so you don't have to mess about getting yourself... Um, um, you know, getting the back wheel off the, off the deck using an ABBA stand or a paddock stand, you can just stick it onto the centre stand. While I'm on that subject, how hard is it to get on the centre stand, people often ask. Well, uh, quite usefully, they've put a little handle on this side of the bike, so to get it on the centre stand is actually quite straightforward, he says. Um, there we go. <laughs> I made it look hard, but I'm a wimpy sort of bloke, but no, that's absolutely fine to get on the centre stand, no problem at all. Um, what else? While we're on practical matters. Oh yeah, the reach to the floor is the other thing that people often ask. How hard is it to get your feet on the deck? Well, it is quite a uh, low bike, I'm glad to say. So in my case, I'm 5 foot 8, a 32 inch leg, and I can get my feet flat on the deck either side of the bike. So it's an easy reach to the floor, so uh, absolutely no problems there. So what's the uh, interceptor like in the urban environment through town then? Well, I have to say, very agreeable. It's a very light feeling bike when you're riding it. It feels a lot lighter than, for example, my Street Triple, which I've always had marked down as a light feeling bike. So it's easy to uh, throw around the streets. And it doesn't feel very uh, wide either. So I think from a filtering point of view, you'd be absolutely fine as well. You're sitting quite high, so you've got a good view over traffic to plan your route through. I think as a commuter, the interceptor would be absolutely fine. Throttle response at slow speeds is nice and smooth, there's no jerkiness. Nice, uh, loud note to the engine as well, so you can hear the thing coming. Yeah, I think as a commuter or in the urban environment, the uh, interceptor is absolutely cracking. Okay, so at the beginning of this uh, review, I promised you I'll give you my findings on the cost of ownership of the motorcycle. So I've done a bit of research as usual, written it down so I don't get it wrong. So first thing to know, here in the UK, road tax cost. Uh, it is over 600cc, so you get the top whack of road tax, unfortunately, or vehicle excise duty, as we should call it here. Uh, that is £91 per year if you pay in a single payment. So uh, 
There we go. Uh, so that's a bit of a shame. Expensive. Uh, insurance. Uh, actually, the insurance on this, absolutely brilliant. I got a quote from my friends at uh, Principal Insurance. £82 fully comp with uh, £250 excess. So uh, absolute bargain on the insurance front. Incredible, isn't it, that the insurance on the bike is actually uh, less than the uh, road tax. What is going on there? Uh, servicing. Now, this isn't so good news. Uh, servicing on this, there's a running in um, service at 300 miles. And because the bike has a slipper clutch, it runs on fully synthetic oil, which is quite expensive. That means that running in service service is 250 quid so that's going to come around quite quickly so that's a bit of a shame uh, then it needs servicing every 3,000 miles which is uh, again quite a short service interval for a bike these days and again uh, that's the synthetic oil required for that and also um, it's uh, valve clearances every time as well so uh, that service comes out as something like 400 quid uh, depending on where you go, of course. Uh, so assuming, um, you, if, let's work this figures out on 5,000 miles a year because I do these comparatively for other bikes as well. So at 5,000 miles a year, that's um, £400 for service plus two-thirds of £400, so £666 per annum for servicing. hope that makes sense. So if you add that all together, 666 for servicing, 91 for tax, 82 for um, insurance, gives you a grand total of uh, £839 per annum to keep the bike in the garage. Of course, that excludes consumables like tyres and brakes, which you'll have to do as well at some point or other. Uh, if you divide that by 12, that comes to 69.91 per month just to have the bike in the garage ready to ride. Now, actually, that's not that cheap. Well, that's a cheap bike to um, purchase, not so cheap to run. Uh, and just for comparative um, purposes, I recently did the same calculation for a brand new BMW F850 GSA, a premium adventure bike, and that came out at about 10 pounds a month less to keep. So uh, just something to bear in mind with the Interceptor. So to clean the Royal uh, Enfield Intercept 650 then, not anticipating it to be particularly difficult, is a, um, you know, an unfaired bike, so it does throw the sort of crud all over itself, but there's not an abundance of scaffolding and stuff, it's not like uh, a big old adventure bike, so hopefully it won't be, I think it's going to be a middling bike to clean. Uh, one of the things to point out is, I've been riding this in the crud, the rain and stuff, uh, and some of the bright work here, the chrome stuff in particular, is looking a bit dull, so uh, that's what I'm uh, in particular going to be working on, but uh, I'll give her a clean, I'll see what she comes out like. So there we go, there's the cleaning done. Pretty happy with how it came out. I have to say, actually, it was a little bit fiddly, uh, particularly around sort of the, um, the engine cooling and around the uh, oil cooler as well. Uh, so yeah, a little bit fiddly. You've got a lot of cleaning to have one of these bikes. And uh, I'm glad to say that the bright work came up really beautiful. So the chrome stuff, the exhaust heads, etc., just gave those a wash and a wipe and they look as shiny and new as you like. The uh, sort of polished aluminium cases, I gave them a bit of a go with some Auto Glim metal cleaner. Uh, haven't spent ages on them, but they have come up quite nicely, but I can imagine over time, and might start to get uh, somewhat tarnished, so you'd need to pay a bit of attention to the engine casings, I think. But uh, overall, pretty pleased with the uh, finished article. So what's the Interceptor like then uh, at night time? Well, let me just pull over here in this bit of shade. OK, it's not night yet, but I just want to show you what the uh, lights are like before I show you what it's actually like using it at night. I'll just stop here for a moment and show you the lights and, and she's normally running. So this is the normal light, so the dipped headlight when you're running, uh, just uh, you know, as you'd expect. And then uh, nothing complicated with the lighting on this, just a straightforward full beam and dip beam. So there we go, there's full beam. I'll come right to the very front. You can see it is indeed very bright and uh, dipped is there. And then if you want a flash, you've got this uh, trigger flasher there as well. And you can just flash the light in the usual way. So nothing, uh, nothing complicated there. Let's, uh, with the magic of YouTube, then switch to night time and see what it's like actually riding in the night. So actually riding at night then on the Interceptor, what's that like? Well, I'm recording this in the summer, so it's not completely dark yet. It's about nine o'clock uh, and it's still not quite dark, but uh, it is dark enough to need lights. And you can tell uh, by riding like this, even at this sort of twilighty stage, that actually the headlight on here isn't too bad. I wasn't expecting great things actually because it's a bog standard halogen light, it's not a clever LED or anything like that, uh, which most bikes these days seem to have and I'm used to riding with and they do chuck out a lot of light. But this is uh, perfectly adequate, it has to be said. Just come up to a slightly darker lane up here, so I'll put her on full beam when we get up here just to see what that's like. 
As far as everything else is concerned, the switch gear is not backlit, but you wouldn't expect that, and it's such simple switch gear on here anyway, you don't need it to be fair. Uh, and the instrumentation at night is adequately lit. Nice with this white light, it just looks quite classy actually with the red needles like that. Okay, so here we are, slightly darker lane. We've got some overhanging trees up here, so it should get even darker. And then I can try the full beam, see how that looks. Here we go, so there's dip, and that's full beam. So dip and full beam. Both seem really good actually. Dip throws the light quite a long way and full beam just gives you a lot more width. Doesn't throw it a lot further. Just go back to dip because we've got a car coming. But yeah, once again, nothing complicated about this bike. It's not a complicated bike. And riding at night, the lighting on board is perfectly adequate. So no problems there. So what would it be like to go touring on the uh, Royal Enfield Interceptor 650 then? Well, pretty good I would think. The riding position is very comfortable. The seat on it is nice and well padded. And uh, because it's long, depending on your height, you can move around on it and get yourself comfortable. So all day long comfortable riding position, no problem there. If you're doing long motorway miles, well, there's no wind protection as such. This one's got the little tiny bikini fairing type screen thing on here, which uh, gives you a little bit of protection. But other than that, there's nothing. Thank you, sir. But the wind blast coming at you is not dirty, I'm, pl I'm pleased to say. It's not a turbulent air, so you wouldn't get fatigued with the wind blast. That's just normal uh, naked bike stuff. Plenty of room on the back seat to strap a bag as well if you haven't got a pillion. And there are plenty of aftermarket racks available for the bike, so you can put one of those on and strap your luggage on as well. Although I'm not aware of actual any official panniers available for the bike. But a lot of fun doing this sort of back roads, the B roads. It'd be a fabulous bike to tour on, I reckon. Pretty frugal as well, wouldn't cost you a lot in petrol. Comfortable and fun, no reason why you can't go touring on one of these at all. Okay, so at the beginning of the video, I said I was going to let you know uh, about the lessons I've learned on this bike since I've been riding it. What are the pros and cons? Well, I'm going to start with the negatives. There aren't actually that many. I do try and uh, give as much of a balanced review as I can, and I try and nitpick as, as much as I can about bikes. But uh, really, honestly, there isn't too much not to like about this bike. It's nice and simple, uh, and it does what it should do. So a few things that, uh, that I've picked out. Number one, uh, the standard mirrors on the bike. Uh, are a bit naff, I think. These actually are, are, aren't, aren't the standard ones. These are some nicely made Royal Enfield ones, but they still look a little bit um, Mickey Mouse to me. I don't like this style of mirror on this bike, so if it were me, I think I'd go for some bar ends, but that's a minor point just around aesthetics. Uh, next thing is the indicators. Although they look a bit, they, you know, they do look in keeping with the whole retro theme of the bike and they do look period, they are a little bit plasticky. They're not actually made of uh, proper metal, I don't think. Uh, they're some sort of plasticky, chrome plastic effect. Uh, don't like those too much, so again, something else that maybe I would change if I had one of these bikes, but again, minor point. Um, next thing I've mentioned here is long-term durability unknown. Um, this bike has been the demonstrator up at the bike den for about the last six months, as I say, since I last rode it. And it's been out in all weathers and it's done, I don't know how, what the total mileage of this bike is actually, but it's done a fair few miles. Um, it's holding up pretty well actually, I mean the exhaust is still lovely and shiny. Uh, I did notice that the, um, the engine cases were starting to look a little, no, there's no pitting or corrosion or anything like that, but uh, a little bit marked. Uh, and uh, you will have seen when I did the uh, cleaning video that I did give that a bit of a clean up. But it's come up okay, but uh, long term uh, it remains to be seen how well the finish will hold up. But actually, based on six months of riding in, in all weathers, at the moment this one's looking alright. There's no rust or anything that I can see. And once you've cleaned it, as I have now, you know, looks pretty good, I think. Um, then the only other thing that I could find that was um, potentially negative is that the suspension, this is the standard suspension, can get a little bit out of shape at high speeds. Now if you're on a motorway and you're going you know, at illegal speeds, there does, there, it does feel a little bit as if it's going to wobble around on you. Uh, I mean with it up to 70 miles now it's no problem at all, but I did, uh, on a closed road, I did uh, try and see how fast the bike would go. It's, uh, it's ample, um, but at very, very high speeds it does feel, start to feel a little bit unstable. So just one small thing. And also when you're going around the lanes as well, if you're going fast and pushing hard around the corners, it can get a little bit wobbly and a little bit out of shape. But, you know, the bike is a value for money bike. The suspension is uh, built to a price. It's in no way bad. The ride quality is, um, is really nice actually, but can get a bit out of shape once you start pushing on. You know, if you're a performance rider, number one, you're probably not going to buy one of these, but if you do, uh, then you can easily change the rear shock. So uh, that's it for the negatives. I, I, and I've scoured it. I really can't find anything else bad about the bike. All right, well, enough uh, whinging about the bike. What about the positives? And I have to say, there are way more positives to list about this bike uh, than I could possibly go through in a review like this. It's just a, it's just a great, fun bike. So some of the things that uh, 
you know, struck me after riding it for a couple of days. Number one, and the thing that attracted me to the bike in the first place, I just think it looks brilliant. It looks like a motorbike should look, doesn't it? It looks properly like, in my mind, a bike when I was a young kid. Sort of early 70s type of motorcycle, particularly with the air cooling as well. It just looks like a proper motorcycle. So, ticking the box for looks as far as I'm concerned. The next thing that when you actually ride it that strikes you is it feels lovely and light. Now, I'm used to riding things like Triumph Bonnevilles and so on, and the previous generation 865 Bonnevilles were quite heavy bikes. They look sort of similar, but you jump on them, they feel quite lardy and heavy. This, completely the opposite. This feels lightweight. This feels lighter than my Street Triple when I jump onto it. So I love the lightweight about it. It's, uh, that's a, a great feature on the bike. Uh, next, it's the, the riding characteristics. It's, got, it's a twin, a big old twin, but it's really smooth to ride, uh, and it sounds lovely as well. These are the standard exhaust pipes on here. It's got a lovely low rumble. Um, it's just a satisfying piece of kit to ride. I really like the way that the, that the thing rides. Um, it's got lovely power delivery as well. If you're riding it slowly, there's no jerkiness in the throttle, um, and the bike goes perfectly fast enough as well. It'll easily keep up with traffic on motorways. It goes way more than the legal limit uh, if you need it to. Um, and yeah, you'll have no problem overtaking traffic and so on. So uh, although the power is um, tuned so it's low down, it's grunty lower down more than up top, um, it's a perfectly fast enough bike. So I love the power delivery uh, and the fact that it's got um, good enough power. The gearbox is really good as well. That's the next thing on my list. Uh, I, again, Royal Enfields in the past I've ridden, the gearbox has frankly been pretty terrible and clunky. This is as smooth as you like. That allied together with the um, slipper clutch means that it's got a lovely, lovely action to the gearbox. It's easy to find neutral. You don't get any false neutrals. Uh, it's just a nice gearbox on this. Um, next thing, uh, build quality. Again, I shouldn't say this because, you know, why would you expect a manufacturer that makes thousands and thousands of bikes a year to have poor build quality? It's that Indian thing, isn't it? I don't know why people have a problem with bikes being built in India. Obviously, Royal Enfield know what they're doing. They've been building bikes for donkey's years now. Uh, and the quality on this bike is absolutely fine. The build quality is no uh, lesser than any other motorcycle you might find on the market, so I have no worries there. Things like, if you look at the welds on the frame here, I know this is a frame that's uh, made by Harris Performance, which is actually a UK company. I don't know if they're actually welded up here or what, but, but the welds on the frame are absolutely lovely. There's no spattering on them. They don't look like bird droppings. Uh, it really is a quality-made bit of kit. I love it. Uh, next thing, and this is, uh, you know, probably one of the big sellers, and it's just amazing value, £5,500 one of these on the road, which is just, you know, show me another bike that delivers what this does for £5,500, incredible value for money. Um, what else? Uh, it's a blank sheet for customising. Um, if, you're, if you're, you know, big into modifying bikes, then this is, you could do all sorts of amazing things with this, couldn't you? You could make a great scrambler out of this, for example, chopping off the back end, putting some knobbly tyres on, uh, maybe a different exhaust. It would be absolutely fantastic. So blank sheet canvas as far as customised is concerned, or if you're a bit of a technical numpty like me, there are loads of accessories you can buy from third parties and Royal Enfield to make the bike your own. So if I would have one of these, I'd certainly enjoy bolting some accessories on. Um, and then uh, last but not least, I just call it kind of, proper old school um, back to basics biking. There's no riding modes, there's only ABS, there's no other electronics on it. The thing just, uh, just makes you feel good to ride and that's the most important thing about a motorcycle, isn't it? Okay, so there we have it. That's my uh, more in-depth review of the uh, Royal Enfield Interceptor 650. I mean, my summary of the bike, um, as you can probably gather, I absolutely love the bike. It's absolutely brilliant value uh, for money to buy. A little bit expensive to, to run, of course, uh, based on those servicing costs. Um, but it, it rides beautifully. I think it looks absolutely amazing. It looks just like a, an old British bike should do. Uh, and the top thing for me is it's absolutely great fun as well. It just makes you feel good when you're riding it. So, uh, yeah, great bike, and I thoroughly recommend them to the house. I'm, uh, I'm quite smitten by them, I have to say. Uh, must just say a big thank you to uh, the guys at the bike den up in Watford they're the Royal Enfield dealers up there if you want to go on this very bike then go and check them out and uh, they'll set you up on a ride and you can see what I've been talking about um, hopefully that's been of some interest giving you some insight into the sorts of things that if you're in the market for one of these bikes that you might be interested in it certainly uh, has helped me over the last couple of days to really understand the bike and uh, if you've not been to my channel before I don't just do uh, bike reviews on here on the Vistenden Flyer but I do things like trips and tours at home and abroad I do bits and pieces about how to look after bikes here in the garage uh, I do product reviews I do monthly bike news, I do the odd live stream, basically anything and everything about motorcycles. I'll try and cover it here on Mission and Fly. It'd be fantastic to have you subscribe if you've not done so already, and uh, then you can catch up on all my other videos. Alrighty, that's it for this time then. I hope there's been of some interest, and look forward to speaking to you next time. Until then, this has been the Mission and Fly. Cheerio.